My dear friends, welcome to Streams of Grace, the Sacraments. Now, in the last episode, we recognized how beautiful is the infant baptism, of course, the adult baptism and infant baptism, what are the difference, and how in a baptized person, the Lord's and clothing of His holiness that Christ come upon and the Holy Spirit come upon and this neophyte become another Christ and also sharing into the priestly, prophetic and kingly office of Christ. So we are already such people, my dear friends. We are not ordinary people. <laughs> Hallelujah. So now we continue on this journey, how the baptism is relating to our faith and how we grow in faith through baptism that we see in this episode. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank and praise you for this great mystery of baptism, day by day is unfolding, revealing to us. And we are learning from the great mysteries, from the teaching of the church, the catechism of Catholic Church, explaining these mysteries. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now we come to the next point, paragraph 1253, Faith and Baptism. Baptism is a sacrament of faith, but faith needs the community of believers. It is only within the faith of the church that each of the faithful can believe. The faith required for baptism is not a perfect and mature faith, but a beginning that is called, called to develop. The catechumen or godparent is asked, what do you ask of God? What do you ask of God's church? The answer, the response is faith. So this is the first question the catechumen or the godparents are asked by the priests. What do you want from the God's church? The response is faith. So in one way, we are asking faith, but at the same time, without a preliminary faith, we cannot understand these mysteries. We cannot, uh, we cannot process this whole sacrament. 1254. For all the baptized children or adults, faith must grow after baptism. For this reason, the church celebrates each year at the Easter Vigil the renewal of baptismal promises in the Easter Vigil night. Preparation for baptism leads only to the threshold of new life. Baptism is the source of that new life, that new life in Christ, from which the entire Christian life springs forth. It is a font of Christian life, the baptism. So, every Easter night, so it is actually a great uh, mystery, but we are not really aware what happened on the Easter vigil night. In fact, after so many days of London preparation, London mission, London retreat, and Lord, every day in the gospel and the letters we have, we have been taught the salvation history and mystery. And then through the holy week we go through and finally we come to the night of Easter Vigil. If we follow the whole Lenten season in this way and to renew our baptism with the renewed understanding of 
grown up in faith every year. So, renewal of baptism every year during the Easter time the church is doing, but we are not much aware of this. So, with the conscious awareness we should participate in the baptismal renewal in the Easter vigil rites. For the grace of baptism to unfold, the parents' help is important. Parents and godparents. So too is the role of the godfather and godmother, who must be firm believers, able to ready to help the newly baptized child or adult on the road of Christian life. Their task is truly ecclesial function. The whole ecclesial community bears some responsibility for the development and safeguarding of the grace given at baptism. Godparents must be firm believers. At the beginning of this year, in the first week of January, me and my wife, we we were godparents for a family's four children. Now they become Christians. From age 20, then 17, 15, 10, like that. Four children. And so I was standing and giving them complete confidence and faith for these four new Christians. That was a beautiful experience. So our faith, our faith is a seed. Our faith is needed for their growth. Who can baptize? This is very interesting. Pay attention. 1,256. The ordinary ministers of baptism are the bishop and priests. And in the Latin church also the deacon. In case of necessity, pay attention, anyone, even a non-baptized person with the required intention can baptize. (laughs) Hallelujah. In the case of necessity, anyone, even a non-baptized person with the required intention can baptize. By using the Trinitarian baptismal formula, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, name, and pour the water. The intention required is to will to do what the church does when she baptizes. The church finds the reason for this possibility in the universal saving will of God and the necessity of baptism for salvation. Suppose in a hospital, a patient who is going to die, but that person wished to have baptism. So any person who is there, who has the will, can give baptism. Or a little child is born, going to die, or needed an emergency baptism. A couple of days back, one woman told me, she, she is not yet baptized, but she is a believer. She said, the Holy Spirit told me to go to her aunt's house. They are all non-Christians. And when she reached her aunt's house, she was sick, an elderly woman. Then her... Um, granddaughter who was there caring for her said oh since you have come you please be with uh, uh, grandmother I will go out to do some shopping she was waiting for someone to be (laughs) for a replacement and then the Holy Spirit told she said the Holy Spirit told me ask this grandmother this elderly woman do you need baptism and she said, yes. And 
she baptized him. Because she remembered this teaching, even a non-baptized person with the required intention can baptize. That old woman was thinking she is going to die. But as soon as she received baptism from this lady who is not a Christian, but a believer, soon after she got much strength and courage and healing and she got up and began to walk. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's it. I remember once in Singapore when I was in a Chinese family, I was asked to come for prayer. Then she was very sick. She was about to die. So we rushed there. So I asked a priest to come with me with all the required things. Then I realized she was a Christian long time back. She was baptized. But then she went to so many other religions. So I made her to understand the baptism once received never go away so you can renew your baptism. Eh? Is it possible? I thought because I went to so many other religions everything is gone. I said no. The stamp which is put on your soul cannot go away. So you you renew your baptism and confess now and receive Holy Communion. And also receive the sacrament of healing. My goodness. That means renewal of baptism and another sacrament of healing, confession, sacrament of healing, sacrament of Eucharist. All this in one hour's time is administered. This woman who was about to die got up and walked and came to the door to see of us. So, my dear friends, renewal of baptism and baptism itself has great power, great power, great power. Renewal of baptism. Every one of us, that is what happening in all the renewal retreats, life in the spirit seminars. We are more and more understanding our faith. And then as we grow in the understanding of the faith, you can renew. You can renew. So, the necessity of baptism. 1,257. The Lord Himself affirms that baptism is necessary for salvation. He also commands His disciples to proclaim the gospel to all nations and to baptize them. <laughs> baptism is necessary for salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed. And who have had the possibility of asking for the sacrament. The church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude. This is why she takes care not to neglect the mission she has received from the Lord to see that all who can be baptized are reborn of water and the Spirit. God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but He Himself is not bound by these sacraments. That's the point. This is, the Lord said you must baptize, but God is not bound by that, not bound by His sacraments, but, but He Himself. Because He has several other ways the church has always held 1,258. The firm conviction that those who suffer death for the sake of the faith without having received baptism are baptized by their death for and with Christ. Baptism, this is baptism of blood. Like the desire for baptism, 
brings about the fruits of baptism without being a sacrament. So this baptism of blood, like the desire for baptism, that person had a desire for baptism but could not receive, brings about the fruits of baptism without being a sacrament. For catechumens, 1,259. Catechumens who die before their baptism, their explicit desire to receive it together with the repentance for their sins and charity assures them the salvation that they were not able to receive through the sacrament. So the, that is called desired baptism. They had the desire. Now parent 1260 says, since Christ died for all, that's the point, and since all men are in fact called to one and the same destiny, which is divine, we must hold that the Holy Spirit offers to all the possibility of being made partakers in a way known to God of the Paschal Mystery, Paschal Mystery, Lumen Gentium. Since Christ died for all, and since all men are in fact called to one and the same destiny, it is divine. We must hold that the Holy Spirit offers to all the possibility of being made partakers in a way known to God. This is to be understood. In a way known to God. We do not know. But God has many ways. I remember a girl who said, My name is Ambili. I never heard about Christ from any Christian or any TV channel or radio, anything. But one day in the night when I was sleeping, I saw suddenly somebody calling me and I got up a white garmented Lightful, glorious person, beautiful standing, said, Ampli, I am Jesus. And Jesus began to teach me directly. See, that is how God has many ways. God, in a way known to God alone, Every man who is ignorant of the gospel of Christ and of his church, but seeks the truth and does the will of God in accordance with his understanding of it, can be saved. Every man who is ignorant of the gospel, gospel of Christ and of his church, but seeks the truth and does the will of God, in accordance with his understanding of it, can be saved. It may be supposed that each person would have desired baptism explicitly if they had known its necessity. They would have desired the baptism if they would have known about it. Nobody taught him, nobody proclaimed him. But Christ has already taken over their sins. So this is how the non-Christians are also saved through the salvific plan of Christ. As regards children who have died without baptism, the church can only entrust them to the mercy of God as she does in her funeral rites for them, indeed the great mercy of God who desires that all men should be saved. And Jesus' tenderness toward children which cause him to say, 
let the children come to me, do not hinder them. Allow us to hope that there is a way of salvation for children who have died without baptism. All the more, urgent is the church call not to prevent little children coming to Christ through the gift of the holy baptism. So, my dear friends, there is a lot of mystery, hidden way is possible for those who are non-Christians and those who die without baptism. They also will be saved. As we said in one of the earlier sessions, that the man paralyzed was brought to Jesus by four people. That four people are believers. But this man paralyzed, who is he? He is, cannot be baptized. But seeing the faith of that people, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Child, my child, my son. So when Jesus called that person my child, he is already baptized him <laughs> through the faith of that four persons. So that is all meaningly God alone, the way known to God alone. The way known to God alone. Now we are trying to understand how is the working of the grace. There are different working of the grace in the baptism, paragraph 1262. The different effects of baptism are signified by the perceptible elements of the sacraments, sacramental rites. Immersing in water symbolizes not only death and purification, but also regeneration and renewal. Thus, the two principal effects are purification from sins and new birth in the Holy Spirit. So, the grace of the baptism... I have told many, many times, grace means participation of divine life into human life. So the grace of baptism is when the child is immersed in water, the regeneration and purification take place. Thus the two principal effects are purification from sins, number one, and a new birth in the Holy Spirit, number two. These are the two principal working of grace. Now, paragraph 1263 is very important. The forgiveness of sins. By baptism, all sins are forgiven. Original sin and all personal sins, as well as all punishments for sin. In those who have been reborn, nothing remains that would impede their entry into the kingdom of God. Neither Adam's sin, nor personal sin, nor consequences of sin, the gravest of which is separation from God. This is very important. Paragraph 1263. My dear friends, let us thank God for this great wonder, great wonder, that through baptism we are separated and sanctified and forgiven from all sins and the punishment of sin. There is no punishment for those who are baptized because Christ has taken over that punishment and set us free. There is no punishment. Even now we say, oh, he has a sinner, he must be punished. <laughs> that means you don't believe in the baptism. God never punished anybody. God instead has come to take the punishment upon him and save that person. So, my dear friends, let us pray. Oh, what an unfathomable riches is opened to us through baptism. The faith... What do you ask from the church of God? I ask faith. Yes, 
gratitude. Through baptism, we have received the fond of faith. And we need to learn more about that faith. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us to understand the mystery of our faith. All you have been baptized into Christ, help put on Christ. Hallelujah. All you have been baptized into Christ, help put on Christ.